Hello, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Telescope Talk, the professional version. My name is Tony Darnell from deepastronomy.space, and this is the hangout where we meet with professional astronomers from around the world to discuss the latest discoveries, equipment, and observatories from the perspective of doing things on the ground. Uh, this hangout will highlight all of the amazing stuff being done from ground-based observatories and will examine not just the science that's being accomplished, but we'll dive deep into the equipment being used, the observatories being built, and we'll also look at what it's like to work at a ground-based observatory. Now, right now, these Hangouts aren't sponsored by anybody, but if you're watching and you think you might want to put your name on these growing and extremely interesting Hangouts, feel free to reach out because now is your chance. We can use all the help we can get here at Deep Astronomy. The idea is for alternating two to Tuesdays, uh, we will have a pro version of these Hangouts, that's this one, and then an amateur version for amateur astronomy for the hobby that's designed to let you know what's going on in the hobby of amateur astronomy. So stay with us and hopefully you'll check them out. If you like them, I'd appreciate it if you give us a thumbs up or maybe share these with other people who you think might interest in, you might find that they would be interested in. <laughs> and I also want to mention that I am taking the audio of these Hangouts and I'm posting them as a podcast on anchor.fm slash deep astronomy so you can listen to them in your car and it is syndicated everywhere podcasts are syndicated. So there's another way to listen. Now today's Hangout features the Square Kilometer Array, an international effort to build the world's largest radio telescope, which will eventually cover one square kilometer, hence the name, which is a million square meters of, co of collecting area. That's a pretty big telescope. The scale of the SKA, as it's called for short, represents a huge leap forward in both engineering and research and, develop, and research and development towards building and delivering a unique instrument with the detailed design and preparation which is now well underway. Now as one of the largest scientific endeavors in history, the SKA will bring together a wealth of the world's finest science, scientists, engineers, and policymakers to bring the project to fruition. The SKA will eventually use thousands of dishes and up to a million low-frequency antennas, and we'll talk about what those are in a minute, that will enable astronomers to monitor the sky in unprecedented detail and survey the entire sky much faster than any system currently in existence. Right now, those antennae are being built in South Africa and Western Australia. My guests today are Dr. Jeff Wagg. He's an experienced astronomer that has worked with radio interferometry data from some amazing places like the VLA, the Very Large Array in New Mexico, OMA in Chile, and he's now a project scientist, one of four, I'm told, at the SKA. Also joining me is Daniel Hayden, a systems engineer on, uh, uh, well, actually he calls himself a, uh, yeah, systems engineer uh, on the project as a whole, but particularly for the low frequency array that's being built in West Australia. So welcome guys, and let me pull everybody up. Let me put my little badge there. And there we go, down in the lower left of our, I've got our Brady Bunch here, but let me also introduce my co-host, uh, Christian Reddy from, he is from, um, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank, um, Launchpad <laughs> Astronomy, gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> hi Chris, it's good to see you again. Hey Tony, good to see you again. I how wrote are you that doing? Down on my little thing. So, how are you doing? It's been it's been we 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 did it our inaugural our inaugural. I guess this is yeah, kind of like our soft launch uh, preview thing, you know. And we yeah. did that back. Uh, we did that last month, and uh, we're back. And as Tony said, we're going to be. I'll be joining. Uh, I'll be joining you every two weeks to talk about professional observatories such as square kilometer what. <laughs> square kilometer array that's a ska right yeah is a ska, <laughs> ska okay because i keep i keep i keep you know hearing like the the old ska band madness in my head you know remember <laughs> i'm stepping on i just want to hear it anyway great to see you guys every yeah every thanks guys great to be here yeah, yeah, great to be here okay good so yeah i just want to point out this is uh so in the lower we have a little brady bunch going here with our with our hangout so in the in the lower left is uh is dr uh is dr wagon in the upper right um, upper upper left is daniel so welcome guys all right who well, i gave a brief introduction to what s the uh, square chronometer ray is but i wonder um jeff maybe you could give us a super high resolution picture or from the <laughs> 60,000 feet up of what's going on with this, with square, the square kilometer array and what you hope to do with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. 
Um, so let me just start by re reiterating what you said earlier. Um, we are building uh, what will be the largest radio telescope uh, ever built. Um, it will consist of, in fact, two separate telescopes, as you mentioned earlier, one in Western Australia. This is our low frequency uh, array of dipole antennas. We call this SK-1 low. And then in the crew of South Africa, uh, we'll be building out uh, something on the order of 133 50 meter diameter dishes uh, to combine with the existing Meerkat instrument. We'll come back to that a little bit later uh, to form the mid to high frequency array SK-1 mid, uh, which uh, combined will really give us uh, broad uh, frequency coverage uh, for our ability to study phenomena such as pulsars, uh, gas in galaxies through their H1 line, uh, transient phenomena such as, well, pulsars as well as what we call fast radio bursts. And at lower frencies, uh, we'll have the ability to actually study uh, effectively what is uh, what you could view as the formation of structure uh, in the early universe through the redshifted uh, 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen. So a lot of exciting stuff. And it's been uh, one of the most rewarding aspects of the project has been um, the collaboration uh, that has existed uh, in order to put this thing together. We've got now 12 member countries of the SK organization. Uh, we have the three host countries, the UK, uh, South Africa, and Australia. And most recently, we've been joined by our colleagues in France and Spain. So we're really excited about all of that. And uh, we're actually in the process of finishing uh, the design work of these two telescopes uh, with the expectation that construction should begin in early 2020. So it's been a, bit, a busy time, uh, but we have some exciting things to look forward to. So you're expecting to be done uh, in the, would you say, around 20, early 2020? So we'll start construction in early 2020. And then construction should last roughly five or six years. So we'll begin full science operations around 20, toward the end of 2026. When you say that you, you're going to begin construction in 2020, uh, you're not talking about of the entire project. You're talking about which, which specific part of it? So both telescopes. Right now, <clears throat> uh, what exists on the two sites? So there are existing radio telescopes on the two sites. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of crew, we, uh, the crew in South Africa, we have Meerkat, which is an array of um, 64 13.5 meter diameter uh, radio dishes. Okay. Uh, we also have a, a low frequency telescope called HERA in operation on the site there. On the Western Australia side, we have uh, ASCAP, which is an array of dishes, what are called uh, phased array feeds, so these wide field of view cameras mm -hmm. for radio frequencies, uh, as well as the MWA, uh, which is a, a low frequency pathfinder precursor uh, for what will be SK1 low in Western Australia. Okay. And just to, to reiterate, the frequency range for SK1 low will cover 50 megahertz up to 350 megahertz. Uh, in the case of SK1 mid, uh, we'll observe between 350 megahertz up to at least uh, 15 gigahertz, possibly higher frequencies. Okay, great. Thanks for thanks for clarifying. Yeah, so you have yep. a wider range. You have a yeah, basically, you know, as you've already pointed out, it's several telescopes, but really, it's several different types of radio telescopes, all, each yeah. sensitive to different different bands. We have two different types of radio telescopes, but okay. uh, maybe I should, um, for those who are, are interested, the way the interferometer will work is that all these antennas or dishes, um, basically the signals combine in what's called a correlator in order to make a higher resolution, uh, better fidelity image uh, than one would make uh, using one, any one of these dishes by themselves. It's the right. same way that a very large array uh, works um, a, just outside of Socorro, New Mexico. Now the... Uh, uh You've worked on ALMA too, which is the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. Did I get that right? Yep, okay. that's correct. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I love me some acronyms. Uh, okay, so the uh, how ALMA is one of the most I've been told oversubscribed telescopes on the planet yeah. right now because <laughs> it is one of the highest resolution radio telescopes we've ever had in the history of radio telescoping, how will the square kilometer array compare to that? Or is it not fair to compare with that? And what about the wavelength range comparisons? So um, what sets ALMA apart from the, the SK just to begin with is it it works at a higher frequency. And this is part of the reason that ALMA needed to be built at a 5,000 meter elevation site. Um, this is one of the driest sites in the world. So it's been built basically above most of the water vapor in the atmosphere. And unfortunately at these wavelengths, water vapor is uh, effectively acts as, a, as an attenuator for the signal we're trying to observe from space. Um, and so for that reason, ALMA has been built at this high elevation. Uh, it's observing at frequencies almost up to the terahertz uh, regime. And now in the case of the SK, it will observe effectively from 
the upper end uh, of, or sorry, the lower end of where ALMA uh, cuts off, ALMA observes down to something like 35 gigahertz now. And the SK will start uh, observing at 15 gigahertz and below. But we're hoping uh, if the dishes are good enough in terms of their, in terms of their, their final uh, design, their final construction, that we might be able to observe to higher frequencies. But that's still an open question. Okay, I want to get to the kinds of science that you can uh, do with um, with uh, the SKA, and I wonder if now would be a good time for me to show this uh, this uh, fact sheet for science uh, or or not. What do you think? Great, absolutely. Yep. All right, let me let me see if I can get that put together. Uh, there's that. Okay, what I have up is the uh, the PDF file you sent me uh, called uh, Fact Sheet Science. Um, yep. Now, on it, you have here some case studies where you're going to be looking at, uh, well, first of all, you've got a book. It's called the SKA Science Book. What's that? Absolutely. You've got two so volumes actually, of it. So this is very exciting. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy of this here with me right now. <laughs> but a few years ago, we, we put... Um, uh, we put a task to the to the astronomers in the community, and that was to update uh, the science case for the SK. And as you can see here, 1,300 authors uh, got together to put together this lofty two-volume set. Uh, when I say lofty, the entire two-volume set weighs in at nine kilos, and so well at 2,000 um, pages, yeah. <laughs> so two, so it weighs in at nine kilos, and for this reason, uh, most of us um, don't actually have copies of our own. We 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 tend to download the copies for free off the internet. And if you like, uh, I can provide your your, your viewers uh, with a link uh, to the URL that has all of these chapters for free. And what it does is basically Absolutely. covers all of the science uh, that we, we would hope to do uh, with the first phase of the SK as well as the second phase of the SK. Now, I don't think we'll talk about that much here today, but uh, the broader vision of the square kilometer array uh, in many people's minds uh, is to build out uh, the SK to an even larger collecting area uh, sometime in the future, but that will be uh, many years uh, down the road. As I said earlier, we're not expecting to finish completion of the first phase and begin operations until roughly 2026, um, later 2026. Okay, so uh, I need to remind everybody, I didn't because I didn't say this at the top of the Hangout, let me just say it now. I put a link in the description box to a Google Drive folder, and it has all of the visuals that we're using in this hangout so you're free to download them i've gotten permission from the uh, guests here that these are freely available there are there's a trailer for the square kilometer array which i'm not going to show because it's five minutes long and then there's a couple of others that explain that explain the uh the square kilometer array as well there's also this these pdf files that i'm, I'm showing you now as well as everything so if you're having trouble reading it because of the streaming or whatever then definitely uh feel free to download the the, the link is in the description box and that's also for you guys listening on the podcast and you want to follow along with the visuals so this helps you uh, get uh, what we're talking about, even though you're listening. Okay, so uh, so all right, back to this. So we've got you're, you've got a couple of case studies here. One of them is that you're really are you really going to look at gravitational waves with this thing? So what we would like to do, um, I think many of your users, many of your um, listeners, will be familiar with the LIGO results um, that came out last year. Now, mm -hmm. uh, very exciting, a direct detection of gravitational waves. Um, Ground based, by the way ground-based. Uh, what LIGO had detected uh, were the higher frequency waves. What we would like to do is demonstrate the existence of what are called nanohertz gravitational waves. And so this has been predicted to be due to the mergers of supermassive black holes uh, throughout the history of the universe. Um, but because these are very long gravitational waves, uh, one of the only ways, if not the only way, to actually detect them is to time uh, what are called pulsars. And I think, uh, again, many of your listeners will be familiar with these objects. They're neutron stars, which are effectively acting as cosmic lighthouses. So they have very strong magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields uh, trap electrons, which give rise to synchrotron radiation. And that can be detected at uh, low radio frequencies. And so what we see are these pulsars, which are spinning very quickly. And some of those pulsars um, are well enough behaved in terms of uh, their spin rate or their, their, sorry, their, uh, their uh, rotation rate that we can use them to test for the existence of these nanohertz gravitational waves. And so effectively what we're doing is we're timing these pulsars in different areas of the sky. A thousand and millisecond that, pulsars, which I think are millisecond also... Millisecond pulsars. So the ones that uh, are roughly pulsars. periods about you know, on the order of a millisecond. Um, 
and we look at these in different areas of the sky. And oh, we'll I read see... that differently. A thousand millisecond pulsars, not a thousand exactly. millisecond. Pul- okay, not microsecond your... pulsars. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. That'd be and cool, so, but yeah. <laughs> and so if we find these, the gravitational wave should add a signature to the, to the timing residuals so that the mm-hmm. timing rate at which um, we see those pulses coming from these pulsars, it will change as gravitational waves pass through. And so um, this okay. is something that many... Uh, of the current facilities are looking for, but it's only by finding more of these and timing them for longer, as we will do with the SK, specifically SK1 mid uh, in South Africa, uh, that we'll be able to find direct evidence for this nanohertz gravitational wave background. Okay, so you're looking for, so I'm just going to badly summarize this, but basically it sounds like what you're looking for then are, you know, as gravitational waves pass by, they're going to stretch and compress the radio waves, so you're going to get frequency modulations, basically, right? In in the uh, you're going to get what you're glitches in the in the timing signal, so that the yeah. timing, um, the very well behaved millisecond pulsars will have a, a very uh, regular uh, arrival time of the pulse, and so when these right. millis- when these gravitational waves go by, you'll see changes in that very small changes that you can only measure after timing these for a few years and timing the very well behaved ones. Now, would you be able to, uh, I mean, would these gravitational waves, would they need to, they would be emanating from the source that you're monitoring, or are we thinking about gravitational waves from another source interfering, or not interfering, but, you know, affecting uh, the timing of a source that you are looking at? So, very good question. In this case, what we're actually looking for is a stochastic gravitational wave background. So, this will be due to many supermassive black holes that are merging in different parts of the universe. Okay. All right. Let me show you. So I want to look. I want to show this uh, focus group uh, graphic, and then I want to get Dan. I got Dan some questions here. I want to talk about, and then we're gonna. I'm gonna look at your comments and questions on the live chat, folks. So thanks for for being with for being with us on this. Um, okay. So here's all the things. <laughs> Here are all the things that you're going to be doing. Uh, cosmology, cradle of life, epic of ionization, reionization, um, the extra galactic. What the heck is an extra galactic continuum? Hmm. Oh, I. Yeah, what is that? So effectively, what we're what we're talking about there, when we talk about extragalactic continuum, we're talking about uh, broadband radiation. So effectively, um, your radio uh, lights, your your radio continuum light uh, from these objects, and this can come from uh, star forming galaxies. It can come from active galactic nuclei, so black holes at the centers of distant galaxies. It can even come from clusters of galaxies. So sometimes you see radio lights. Uh, coming from uh, effectively the, the 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 medium between galaxies within big clusters, and you're even going to be doing some solar and ionospheric physics with this. So absolutely, uh, yeah. there's a lot going on. It's definitely worthwhile building. I can see why you do. What's and VLBI is that very long baseline interferometry? That's the last Excellent. one there. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and that very good. that is important because that is what lets things like the Event Horizon Telescope work the way it does, right? The event, horizon, Absolutely. the event Horizon Telescope, for those of you who don't know, is um, a uh, an effort that involves ALMA, among a great many other telescopes around the planet, that uses the in, that's going to use the disk of the Earth as its primary mirror, in, and it's trying to image directly image, not just infer, but directly image the event horizon of the of Sagittarius A star. So that's the that's the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and it's using very long baseline interferometry and it's really i don't fully understand how it works but it, it's great and it's complicated and it's a way to take a whole bunch of little telescopes and turn them into a great big one uh is where i guess we'll leave it for now but dan dan well yes to, uh, let you are in, so i can see how it works right i can see that jeff is sitting around coming all this great science and him and his little colleagues and cohorts and they're just going to look at you and say okay now go build it so, right, exactly. so you got to you got to make this happen. So, tell us a little bit about the engineering challenges, and, it's, and and especially with what you're working on, which is the low frequency stuff. All right. Um, so, I mean, to just put up some some numbers, for example, in interferometry, you correlate pairs of antennas. Between both telescopes, you will have uh, over a hundred thousand baselines or pairs of antenna that you're correlating. Uh, You'll have 65,000 frequency channels. And so for both telescopes, we're talking something like, it's over billions of data streams that are gonna be coming out of this telescope that need to be processed, that need to be calibrated. And a lot of this processing and calibration needs to be done in real time. Challenge in doing that. 
uh, the kinds of data rates that we're looking at are, you know, the, the data going to the central processing facility in each for each telescope. Um, we're talking on the order of 10 terabits per second. So it's uh, it's huge data rates. The supercomputers that are going to be processing this data on the back end <coughs> of the telescopes are going to be, you know, some of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. Uh, there are Sorry, just interrupt me, Tony. If I just wanted to, all I wanted to do was ask you, would it be a good a, a chance for me to now put that video up about the data journey while you're talking about uh, it? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'll have that playing while you describe the uh, the data flow and what you're talking about, the supercomputers and all of that. So go ahead. It's playing. Okay. So, we, so we're starting out. All right, with, Oh, are you trying to get it up? So right, so so sort of um, end to end, uh, you've got a uh, radio light that hits an antenna or a dish, and that induces a voltage in, in the receiver, uh, and that's an analog signal. So I'm just going to keep track on the video. Um, that analog signal uh, is extremely faint. Uh, it needs to get amplified, it needs to get conditioned, and it needs to get digitized and that happens, or a lot of that happens at the central signal processing facility, which is a ways away from the antennas and the dishes. Uh, in the central signal processing facilities, you've got digitization, channelization, conditioning of the signal. Um, and then this data can be treated in a number of different ways. It can be correlated to form images, or it could be stacked on top of each other to form um, more sensitive beams, uh, and those beams can be used to detect things in the time domain, which is uh, pulsars. So anyway, so just going back, um, a lot of the processing is then done in the central signal, in the in a central processing facility, which is relatively close to the antennas and the dishes. But um, a lot of further processing needs to be done at a supercomputer, and the supercomputers are going to be located in Perth and in Cape Town, so a couple hundred kilometers away from the, we call the central processing facilities. And, um, and, and there is a lot of calibration and post-processing done, but I'm just looking at the video and, and it, what it shows quite nicely is I think both the uh, time domain processing and correlating the baselines, um, which give you, a, let's say, 100,000 uh, different baselines that need to be correlated and then you have multiple thousands of channels of each of those. Uh, and there's, uh, there, there you go, it sort of sees you, uh, it's just showing you the science data processor. Mm -hmm. uh, well, science data, so the science data processor, uh, which again, massive amount of data, it can't go from the science data processor straight to the scientists. The data is too much and, and too fast. So there's going to be another stage, which is going to be read uh, in the vision is that they're going to be regional, regional data science centers in different places around the world. And they are going to receive sort of pack, um, the data products from these uh, science data pro um, science data processes, and from there, that will be the intermediary from which the scientists will pick up the data. And we're talking um, like SK is going to deliver hundreds of um, of terabytes. Uh, sorry, hundreds of petabytes. So it's, yeah, it's 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 a it's a huge amount of data. Right. So yeah, that was an amazing wow. that was an amazing video. So that shows the yeah. data flow and how they're going through. Now, one of the one of the things that's sort of unique to radio astronomy uh, is that all of these channels, and we saw that in those little fibers coming out of each individual dish, uh, those have to be processed. You said real time, and then and then they need to be further like signal enhanced by putting channels together and, and lining them up, and, and because they come out in a different kind of phase delay, right? In other words, some signals come out at different times. Than, right. than another, and so you've got to put all of that together, right, into a coherent signal. That's right. Okay. And um, what? Sorry, a bit more, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say what what. So what are the? Um, is that is does? <laughs> I'm an, I'm I've worked in optical astronomy all my career, and one of the things that I try to teach people is that signal to noise. If you take a whole lot of small images at 
shorter uh, exposure times and then co-add them, add them up, you end up with a, like, say, you know, say you took a hundred 10 second exposures, uh, you would end up with some, you know, you would end up with something that had the equivalent of a thousand seconds after you've added them all together. But the noise right. has only gone up as the square root of a uh, hundred. So right. the noise doesn't rise as much as the signal does when you add them up. That's something I, I try to, you know, keep going back over with each hangout when we talk about this. In radio right. astronomy, is there an, is that what is that the same thing, or is it is how is signal to noise improved uh, when you've got these very faint signals, or do you just deal with what you got? That's a good question. So, in, oops, sorry, Daniel, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> um, no, I think I think Jeff's best place to answer this question. Okay, so go ahead, Jeff. I'll, yeah, so I'll chime it, in. Uh... It is a matter of it, the longer you observe for, the longer you integrate for that noise goes down as one over the square root of time. So you can uh, decrease the noise by either increasing the bandwidth. So you've got a square, square root of one over time uh, times bandwidth in there. But of course, you know, more dishes also brings down the, the, that noise, the more collecting area, the less noise you'll have. So, okay, let me, so uh, in radio astronomy, if you look at something for 100 seconds, the signal goes up, as if you're looking at it for 100 seconds, but the noise goes up as a square root of 100 seconds. So the signal doesn't the signal doesn't go up, but the noise is going down. The noise is going down in this case. Oh, so the signal stays yeah. the same. It's like when you yeah. tune into a radio station. Oh, oh, oh okay. Cool. Yeah, so yeah. it's like you're staying. Okay. You're tuning into a radio station. It is what it is. And then, but the longer you stare at it, you the noise goes down. How come? The noise is going down. So it's just it, it's um, it's. Uh, counting statistics, so it's it's basically the Poisson uh, nature of the noise, the Gaussian nature of the noise means that um, you know you're counting your uh, effectively your signal. If you're to look at the sky, uh, you've got a contribution from the cosmic microwave background. You've got a contribution uh, from you know, your antenna, your receiver, and you've got a contribution from the source you're looking at. And so what you want to do is you want to get rid of those sort of random components by observing that source in that region of the sky for as long as you can uh, with as big a telescope as you can. So is uh, that why you, I mean, was square kilometer array was the square kilometer uh, decided on because of the science required to do it? Is that because in, in space telescopes, that's how it's done. You look at what science you want to do, and then you look at what telescope would meet those requirements. Is that how the square kilometer array was decided on? Absolutely. So in fact, in the early 90s, uh, radio astronomers got together and they effectively asked the question, if you were to look for atomic 21 centimeter hydrogen emission from a galaxy, say like our Milky Way galaxy, at a large distance, and, and I think the benchmark they use is roughly redshift one. Um, and so if re redshift one, if you were to put a galaxy like the Milky Way or what we call an M-star galaxy at that distance, how much collecting area would it take to detect that galaxy in, in, in each one, 21 centimeter emission. So this, 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 um, this hydrogen emission uh, is already faint. And then as you put these galaxies further away, uh, it gets fainter, but then the hydrogen 21 centimeter emission goes to lower frequencies, the redshift effect. effect. And so as you go to lower frequencies, um, your sky, is, your sky is also getting brighter. So that adds a contribution to your noise. So there are a lot of effects that come into, a play, come into play here, but what it boils down to is that you really need more collecting area to be able to study this hydrogen line at very distant redshifts. Okay, how big is, uh, how big is ALMA? Uh, it's a very good question. I, I'm afraid I don't know off the top oh, yeah. of Sorry, I didn't mean to get you there. I, I, uh, so, but but is it, uh, is it, this will be bigger than ALMA. This will be more collect. This have more collecting area than Alma, but it will lo work at lower frequencies. And lower frequencies. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Alma will still contribute then to the science that's being done here with. Uh, These are very complementary facilities. So, for example, let me just take one science case. So we have the desire to understand how planets form, and so with Alma, you've seen these beautiful images of rings around uh, protoplanetary disks, mm -hmm. and basically what they're showing you is the distribution of millimeter-sized pebbles. And you see gaps in these disks, which might be due to planets in the process of formation. Um, we want to obtain similarly high angular resolution, so 10 to 40 milli arc second angular resolution of systems like this at centimeter wavelengths in order to see the distribution of centimeter sized pebbles. So the wavelength that you're observing uh, is very close to or traces very well 
the size of the dust grains or the pebbles around these protoplanetary systems. And so now, in now order tell to us what okay, I, most people would probably get that you're talking about the precursor of a solar system, but give us a correct. quick idea what a, what a proto, protoplanetary disk is. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the belief is that these um, so planets like our own will form in disks around, around stars. And so you'll see as those planets are in the process of formation, you'll see the debris left over. Uh, well, the, the um, sorry, the, 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 the dust and the pebbles from which these planets are forming in these disks. And so in the early stages of planet formation, most of the, the pebbles will be in very small grains. And so as the planet or as the, the grains coagulate together and form bigger centimeter size and eventually meter sized rocks, uh, we want to study those different formation, um, basically formation phases by studying these systems at different wavelengths. Right. And so, uh, and so, yeah, I wanted to make sure people knew what those were. And those, these dust grains, these, these are like this, this debris is little tiny dust grains, each glowing essentially at various radio wavelengths exactly. that if you had a high enough di uh, resolution telescope, because even in radio, objective equals resolution it's, it's directly proportional. Yeah. And so yeah. you want the big, as big a telescope as you can get to, to make that happen. So um, okay, I want to show. Well, I've got this meerkat. Uh, well, actually, uh, Tony, yeah. if I may briefly interrupt here, um, I just wanted to just relay a, a relay a question yeah, uh, that I saw in the chat, and I think it's applicable to this idea of you know adding more and more uh, detectors. Most that? Um, if we add additional uh, antennae, was well, that an upgrade path for uh, SCA over time? Uh, it could it could be an upgrade path right now for the first phase of the SK. Uh, we set ourselves a cost cap um, at 675 million euros. Mm -hmm. And within that cost cap, uh, we know we can deploy a certain number of antennas. Um, right. In later phases um, of the project, uh, we would hope to add more collecting area, more antennas. Okay, so there are sort of the, that, that is the plan eventually, but yeah. obviously you have to prove the, the system first. And then the baselines, the, dis the distance goes up, well, their vision is that it will go up a lot. So the maximum baseline for the mid, the mid uh, SK-1 mid, the mid frequency telescope in South Africa is 150 kilometers. Uh, adding, adding more dishes to the future, the vision is to go up to several thousands of kilometer baselines. What do you mean by baseline? So the distance between, the maximum distance between any two dishes or any two antennas. And, and that sets your effective aperture, right? That, I mean, that sets your, right. your, your, res, yeah, your resolution. Right, yeah, which, which in turn gives you your resolution. Exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah, so the, uh, to take the single dish case, the largest single dish uh, radio telescope that currently exists is 500 meters across. This is the, the FAST telescope in Western China. And I had the, the fortune to see this for the first time two or three months ago, and it's really an incredible uh, it's really an incredible um, facility. It's really an incredible instrument. It's, it's sitting in a valley, and the dish itself is so big that you don't move the dish itself. You actually move the secondary reflector from these cables hanging on either side of the dish. Hmm. Um, That's like Arecibo, isn't it? It's exactly yeah. like Arecibo, only bigger. Yeah, well, hmm. I think I saw, the, I saw the press release that came out on that. That was a pretty impressive telescope. Um, okay, well, somebody mentioned cost. You said uh, 675 million euros? Correct. Who's, who's, so who's the, is there one country, any group of people in, uh, paying for this? Is it the consortium? How are, who's paying for all of this? So the 12 countries, um, I didn't list all of them at the very beginning, but the 12 member countries will all contribute a fraction of the funding to build uh, the SK. Obviously, there will be return uh, to those countries in terms of the, the observing time uh, that the astronomers in those countries will be awarded uh, based or, or reflecting uh, the amount of a contribution that those countries have made uh, to the project. Oh, is uh, that, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Tony. No, I just I want, so is that going to affect, so you, that is going to affect telescope time? The amount of, uh, the contribution will affect uh, the amount of telescope time the observers or the astronomers in that country will receive. Okay, all right. And that's pretty common yeah. for, for multi you know, organization contributions, right? You mean, you know, it's, it's a function of money, how much money you're putting into it. 
it depends on the right? it depends on the facility, but that is um, becoming more and more the case. Yeah, for sure. Um, we have a question in our chat uh, from SB, uh, and the question is why are the why are there arrays in Australia and in South Africa? Is there an advantage to having them in two distant locations as opposed to all of them in one location? Does it perhaps improve resolution? So I think we kind of know the answer, but why don't you go ahead and just describe? No, I, that's that's a great question. So. Mm -hmm. um, Part of the reason to put these radio telescopes in these remote locations is that we want to get away from human-made interference, radio frequency interference. And that radio frequency interference is stronger at certain frequencies uh, than others. And it turns out for low frequency radio astronomy, the Western Australia site uh, is potentially a little bit better. You still have to deal with things like uh, uh, airplane uh, radio frequency interference mm -hmm. or satellite radio frequency interference, but for the most part, because of the very low population density, uh, the, the the interference uh, from humans is very low, and so it was a good place to put uh, to construct uh, SK1 low. Uh, in the case of the crew, it's at a slightly higher elevation site, uh, maybe a little bit drier, so that would make it a better site for observing at uh, higher frequencies. So SK1 low, uh, what's SK2? So at SK, oh, sorry, Dan, you go ahead. So SK1 uh, low is uh, what is currently, what will, what will be funded. Uh, that is part of the 675 construction budget uh, and that the 12 member countries are going to participate in, in are going to contribute towards. SK phase two, is after that's built, it's a vision to add more antennas uh, and more dishes in both sites, but that, that has not yet, there's not yet a funding plan and a commitment uh, on the, to, to do that. So, so at the moment, the project is SKA phase one, and um, we're currently at the end of the pre-construction, pre we're in the detailed design phase, or nearing the end of the detailed design phase of SKA one. And so what Jeff said it, it, towards the 2020, uh, 26, 27, it will be near the end of construction of SKA phase one. Okay. And okay, uh, great. Christian, you want to read uh, Hans Milling's question? Do you see it there? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think this dovetails pretty nicely yeah. on Hans's question. Uh, so uh, the question is, how are projects uh, for the telescopes chosen? Uh, so are there scientists uh, going to be sending in uh, proposals and will there be a time allocation committee? Uh, like we do this on Hubble and yeah. other observatories. Is it going to work the same for Scott? Absolutely, yes. Um, one uh, maybe small difference is that we intend to allocate a large fraction of the observing time on both telescopes, maybe 50 to 70 percent to large uh, key science projects. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the, the advantages of these telescopes we're building, which have high or fast mapping speeds, is you can map out many uh, hundreds, if not thousands of square degrees uh, on the sky. And in order to do that, it does require a thousand hours or more of observing time. And so we expect, again, to allocate a large fraction of the observing time uh, to these big uh, survey type projects. And so there will be you know, 30% available for smaller PI led projects. Uh, but the expectation is that most of the uh, time will be spent doing surveys. But that uh, time allocation will be decided by a time allocation committee. Great. Okay, I wanna show, I wanna talk about Meerkat. And I've got the picture up of it now that that you sent me. Uh, is this different? What? Well, first of all, what is Meerkat? What does it stand for? What does it stand for? Yeah. I don't. It's it's a, it's the name of an of a tiny animal. I know it's that, but it, doesn't it mean something? <laughs> <laughs> does <laughs> I know it's that? It's, I know what a now you know. Is. Now you know. I just. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but but Meerkat. what does it stand for in this context here? Right, um, Meerkat is. Uh, it's a South African-led and funded uh, telescope that consists of 64 dishes that will form part of the core of SKA-1 MIT. Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's, its own, it's its own project. It will have its own science program, and then it will be absorbed into SKA-1 MIT uh, and, and become part of the 197 dishes that will be SKA-1 MIT. Okay, and uh, this but it's important. mid, with, I'm sorry, that was 350 okay. to 50, 350 megahertz to 15 gigahertz, is that right? Yeah, uh, for SK-1 mid, that's correct, yes. Okay. And did you want to add Jeff, you wanted to add something? Sorry. I was just going to say that Meerkat has just begun uh, science operations, full, full science operations in the last uh, year or so. What's up and going? And 
it's up and going and this is very exciting because we're already seeing some science results uh, coming from this facility our south african colleagues have done a great job uh, in uh, getting your cut up and operational it's, it are scientists uh, from different parts of the world involved in some of the observing projects um, and i think uh, maybe you're going to show it next we have one of the first uh images that have come has come from the meerkat showing it now uh, array and this is an image of the galactic center uh, at, uh, in radio continuum emission. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so, uh, and this is in radio wavelengths too, which is amazing. Correct. Because, so, yeah. so, so this is what we'd call radio continuum emission. Um, this is generally tracing synchrotron emission uh, in the galactic center region. And you see things like supernova remnants so that the, you know, the end products of the death of stars. You also see evidence for magnetic fields um, uh, coming, you know, associated with the galaxy. Uh, so it's really a spectacular image. And, and the fidelity of this image and the resolution of this image is much better than what had previously uh, been possible with telescopes like the Very Large Array. And so uh, it's not shown here, but we have a comparison image uh, that was made with a Very Large Array. Um, we have all, you also need to combine uh, these image, images with a single dish telescope uh, to get what we call the larger scale structure. Uh, so the interferometer will will filter out scales larger than a certain uh, size, uh, which you then need to re or, um, reconstruct uh, by observing these uh, these systems systems like this uh, with a single dish telescope. That's gorgeous. Wow! That's so could I could I just add? So um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really exciting how great this image is, and and that it's the best. Uh, image that we that we now have of the center of the galaxy and this is with 64 dishes so another 130 added 100 oh, wow. added yeah. to that um it's it's exciting yep that's remarkable um just a a, a question that uh we we've uh, kind of had in the chat here and i think this is a good segue to it you know i know that ex exoplanets is a hot topic in astronomy right now so would this would this uh, array be capable of detecting, say, you know, synchrotron radiation coming coming off of a magnetic field of a giant planet? Is that possible? Uh, or excellent question. Yeah, in fact, this is one of the science cases uh, for SK one low. So you can imagine uh, an object like Jupiter, only a hot Jupiter, uh, where you have a very strong uh, interaction of the um, basically the magnetic field of Jupiter or th that um, hot exoplanet. Uh, with the with the, with the stellar wind, and so that can give rise to bursts of low frequency emission, decametric emission, that mm. you might be able to see, or you could possibly detect in nearby uh, exoplanets with uh, SK one low. Wow. All right. Uh, That's any cool. other, do you see any other questions there? Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, question. Uh, about the uh, about the uh, uh, array that we showed earlier, uh, why were they hexagonal shape instead of round? That's an interesting question, uh, Daniel. Uh, I think you were, we I think that image came up while you were speaking. Uh, you were telling us about uh, I believe that was the is that the meerkat array that you were showing or was yeah, that, uh... I've got it back up again. Yeah, it's oh, the meerkat so. array. They they do seem to be kind of hexagonal shaped uh, and not round. Yeah, does that matter? Anybody know why? I I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting shape. I mean, it's an off-axis Gregorian design, but uh, yeah. but yeah, they are quite they're not quite round. They're almost hexagonal. That's odd. Yeah. Oh, cost-saving measure. Who knows? Okay, Galaxia is asking <laughs> so about the, these. The, I got the image back up of the Galactic Center. Galaxia wants to know what these stripes are. I do too. Oh yeah. So the, this is, again, synchrotron ra radiation, but associated with um, uh, magnetic fields in the galaxy. So these have been known about uh, actually for some time. However, uh, they've obviously never been seen with such high angular resolution. And you know, this resolution, it just looks spectacular. So those are, uh, those are following, that's plasma following field lines? In so the following... Galaxy? It's a, so the synchrotron ra radiation associated with the electrons spiraling around these magnetic fields. And that's mm -hmm. from the galaxy, not any, any local phenomenon. These are gal galactic field lines they're following. Galactic. Wow, that's, that's wow. really cool. That look like filaments. And the I supernovae mean, remnants, are those those little blobby things that one of them was on the left? Is that correct? A, is that the supernova correct. remnant? Okay. Correct. That's oh, busy in um, there. Are, and actually, uh, I, this raises... Now I've got another question because yeah, the big blobbies are, are supernova remnants. Uh, what about the more compact 
sources? Could would they be uh, neutron stars or black or stellar black holes? Uh, many of these could also be smaller uh, supernova remnants. Okay. Okay. Wow. So yeah, uh, the ever helpful Discord. If you guys aren't on Discord, by the way, get over there on there and start asking questions on there because it's really it's a really good resource, and I'm on it all the time. But Peter Q went and looked up the Alma stuff, and and uh, we because I asked how big it was, he goes it's and he posted the Wikipedia thing on there that it's 50 antennas of 12 meters in diameter and elevation of 5,000 feet, and so it's got uh it's got uh. Uh, you can do all kinds of different uh, configurations of it, uh, but it is 20 times better than the very large array. It's supposed to be five times better than the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, whenever they say stuff like that, it's better than this and that. They don't say how. But for, first of all, the Hubble Space Telescope looks at the infrared through ultraviolet uh, and the, the VLA and the ALMA. These guys aren't even close to looking at that. So better? I don't know. But definitely different wavelength. Um, and it's terms, I guess maybe they mean aperture. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, that's... Uh, I mean, Alma it certainly is... outperforms Hubble in the radio part of the spectrum. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, because uh, Hubble can't see any of it unless he's listening, unless it's listening to the... Uh... Uh, what is it called? Tedris? <laughs> <You know>, the... <laughs> so anyway, um, you, there are no real issues, are there, with the atmosphere and radio astronomy? It's is are there any? For example, in in infrared astronomy, there are many wavelengths you cannot look at from the ground because of water vapor absorption. Does do radio telescopes suffer from any of that, or is the is the atmosphere pretty transparent to all the radio wavelengths you're looking at? Unfortunately, unfortunately, once you get to higher frequencies, uh, around 22 gigahertz is a water vapor line, so it it does impede us uh, at these. Well, pesky water vapor well. gets in everywhere. <laughs> well, actually, when you get to 70 gigahertz, the big one is the oxygen line, and thankfully that's there. Thankfully, yes, we need that one. Thankfully, it's there. So is that why then, I mean, these these radio telescopes all seem to be built in dry locations. Is that why? Uh, to avoid this water vapor line at, at what did you so, say it was? At, so, at, so in fact, in the case of S, the two SK telescopes, the main uh, driver for the locations uh, has been, show, it's been chosen effectively to get away from radio frequency interference. Uh, so to get away from human made uh, Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. When, okay. Yeah. Please continue. I wanted to ask you about no, that. So you've got to be away from the, civilization to do this. Cor correct. And so, for example, um, you'll choose sites that are radio protected quiet zones. So where we can't put in uh, radio stations or, or, you know, digital TV signals. Um, obviously you'll always pick up some signal, um, especially from, you know, aircraft flying overhead, uh, satellites, uh, there's nothing you can do about. But when you get away from the, the majority of the noise uh, that we have to deal with, uh, you really can see a big difference in your ability to observe the sky. And so I think radio frequency interference is our, uh, effectively, you know, our, is, is worse for us uh, than the water vapor is for Alma at the, high, at the higher frequencies. Can, can, I, can I add something just to give a sense of how sparse it is? I think in, Mur in the Murchison uh, Shire, area the population is about a hundred and the, uh, the area is about as big as Bavaria I think so it's it's really very sparsely populated but um, I also wanted to mention that at low frequencies the water vapor is not not not, not a problem but uh, the ionosphere is a big problem at low frequencies oh. and um, so the ionosphere is um, charged particles in the upper atmosphere and uh, they cause path length uh, distortion path length changes uh, to the waves and, and other problems and because the time variability can be really uh, very really high for the ionosphere and the, and the scales over which it changes can be quite can be quite small um it's a, a big challenge for sk lows to calibrate the ionosphere uh, ionospheric uh, distortions so i guess uh, so there's no cell phone service out there <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't yeah uh, no <laughs> well <laughs> you mean uh, just to get rid yeah, of it. I was gonna say, uh, I, I, I take it there's a there's a quiet order uh, around the around the array, no use of cell phones or anything like that. We expect that will be the case. That's certainly the case. Uh, certainly the case now. Um, now during construction, there will be an increased level of of electrical activity going on on site, and so mm -hmm. these are things you can't do anything about. However, there will be uh, periods set aside uh, when construction activities cannot take place, and people obviously can't use cell phones. Um, 
And these will be the times that we use for, for scientific observing during that construction period. <laughs> How embarrassing would that be? You're talking on your cell phone and everybody in the whole uh, observatory is listening to it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you're, when it. you're done, when you're quite done, we'll continue. Uh, okay, so D-Physics Star, I'm going to ask this question exactly like you wrote it. So just, yes, just so you. there. Is this radio telescope, uh, will it be capable to detect free-floating planets like SIMP, S-I-M-P, J-O-1-3-6-5-6-6-3 plus 0933473, or even with a weak magnetic field? Shall I read that again? <laughs> <laughs> will it's SIMP license plate, yeah. <laughs> Will this be will it be capable of detecting free floating planets? So we're so, we're oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say so. Yeah, so so it's that it's a free floating planet as opposed to a planet associated with a star. Okay, uh, now I see what's yeah as asked. opposed to yeah the planets. I guess the, with stars. the trick would be knowing where to look in this case. So if the magnetic field, no, I'm afraid I'm afraid the answer to that is no. I I think for the most part we are going to have to rely uh, in the future on our optical uh, colleagues. Finding these, finding these exoplanets, and then uh, for us to be able to go out and follow them, follow, follow up, uh, observe them at uh, radio wavelengths. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. I'm going to put this uh, image back up while we ask, while I ask uh, Galaxy this question. Uh, and is the black hole behind or in the bright white light? So where I'm looking at this image again, I've got it back up. So we've got this big here. bright thing in the center of the image. Is uh, Sag Asar behind it? Hello. Yep. It's in there. It is in there somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> not at this wavelength though. Um, I don't. I don't know what wavelength range the Event Horizon Telescope is using. Are they using low so, frequency or higher higher frequency? They're using millimeter wavelengths. Millim of course. Yeah. Of course they are. Yep. Yes. Okay. So in fact, yeah. The, the so they'll Horizon see through this, which is why they're using that wavelength. So, so the Event Horizon Telescope is using sub millimeter millimeter wavelength telescopes around the world. Um, Alma is one of the phase, phase phased Alma is one of the the, the, the baselines. Uh, you've got telescopes in Hawaii like the the JCMT, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope. Um, Owens Valley, I believe, is one of the telescopes, and the Large Millimeter Telescope in Mexico is another telescope uh, in that uh, in that Event Horizon Telescope. But all of these telescopes work uh, predominantly at millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I should have known that. Uh, let me ask Hans this question. Uh, can you take several images over time in the galactic center to detect movement? I remember in the center of the galaxy. So if we had maybe taken some more of these over weeks or months, could we see mo motion along these field lines? Uh, that's an excellent question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we wouldn't see the same kind of movements you see at optical wavelengths where you see stars uh, in orbit around uh, the galactic uh, center black hole. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I don't know if you'd actually see um, any of the radio features changing. But I'll tell you where because, you would, you would see uh, it. So supernova remnants, you might uh, measure their expansion. Right. And uh, you'd also uh, see it when you look at the sun. Uh, you're going to see a lot of activity there. So there's a lot absolutely. of, a lot of uh, electron motions going on uh, in when you look at solar activity. So that's another good use of this. I mean, this is exciting. Okay. Um, Christian, is there any, anything more that I'm missing or should you have any? Well, uh, uh, the, boy, all of a sudden, we're, all of a sudden we're getting all these great questions just toward the very end of the hangout. But um, uh, here, here's one that I'd like to just ask. I, wish, I think it was Galaxia who asked it, but I could be wrong. Um, I, I remember the question was, if this were to look somehow look back at our own solar system, I guess this is more like a SETI application, you know, what would, what would, uh, Scott detect if it were to look, say, from afar, look at our solar system? That's an excellent question. I think oh, Matt, Matt End asked this question. What would Scott theoretically see when it looks at our solar system from a distance? Okay. So depending on the distance, you, you would see the sun as a radio source. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the distance, you would likely resolve Jupiter as another radio source. And if you were to, to observe our solar system with a fine enough time resolution, uh, you would also be hearing uh, and enough sensitivity, depending on your distance, you would have uh, the ability to detect, detect uh, radio signals from Earth, which would be very exciting. So yeah. Earth would not be a dominant radio source as much as and we're broadcasting. I think it would be my, I mean, again, it depends on the distance, but I think it would be drowned out by the sun. Um, would a higher, re a higher diameter, uh, uh, telescope maybe be able to differentiate that signal out of the noise i mean the sun's not noise but you know what i mean 
Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I could answer it, but uh, um, yeah, again, it would depend on the distance. Right, and that's because Galaxia, uh, we it took it's we we've only been broadcasting for a few decades, and so that's the light radius that we would have to uh, you'd have to be within that to really detect anything that came from Earth, and and of course the uh, earlier broadcasts were probably nowhere near as strong as they as they are today, so it would be this sort of ramping up <laughs> of of us getting louder as it goes. Um, good. Okay, so you're saying. That this thing is getting where, where you've you finished the square kilometer array has finished this design testing, is that what? So we're in the, oh, go ahead, Daniel. So we're t nearing the end of the what we're calling the, the detailed design phase. Detailed we're having design a, phase. <clears throat> yeah, we're having a number of critical design reviews for the different parts or subsystems of the telescope. Uh, we're going to have a system critical design review next year, and. Uh, Construction we expect should start uh, 2020 and be so completed in 2026 2027 yeah okay well thank you I, this is great this was a, a, we're we're, om, we're almost out of time here so I want to I want to thank our guests this was our first hangout well done Christian this looked great oh well, thank you Tony time. thanks for having me along and thank you gentlemen for for joining us today really appreciate your time yeah oh, it's yeah, our it was... pleasure guys great to meet you and uh it's been a, it's been a good time thank you yeah it my, was fun. Thank uh, you. so uh my guests today were Dr. Jeff uh, Wagg from he's a he's one of four project scientists for the square kilometer array and Daniel Hayden is the uh, engineering uh systems engineer for the low frequency telescope and I want to thank you both for for attending and I want to remind everybody that next Tuesday we're going to be doing telescope talk only on the amateur version and I've got uh Dustin from uh Ocean Oceanside Photo and Telescope is going to talk to us about the remote controlled observatories. If you followed Fraser on Twitch, then you know that he's been showing a lot of stuff on a remote controlled telescope that's been, been operating live. Uh, and we're going to be talking about that telescope with the people that are uh, building them around the country. I'm trying to talk them into building one here in Florida. And, <clears throat> and, um, Next, this Thursday, Harley Thronson and I will be back with Future in Space, where we will be talking about the Lynx Space Telescope. That's L-Y-N-X. That's a high-energy X-ray telescope that's being considered. It's one of four uh, pro space telescopes being considered as part of the uh, na the Decadal Survey uh, that is going to be announced, I think, late next year in 2019. And so we're going to get a status report on what they're doing, and we'll learn about this, the uh, the uh, science and the capabilities of the Lynx Space Telescope. So that's this Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. On behalf of my co-host Christian, uh, Christian Reddy from Launchpad Astronomy. See, I got it this time. I want to thank you all <laughs> so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up.